Vice Chancellor, fellow council members and staff of the university, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. To all of you, I extend a warm welcome to this important and happy occasion. To our graduates, I offer congratulations and best wishes for the future. The University of Newcastle is committed to achieving international excellence in education and research and to work through partnerships for regional, national and global enrichment. In the area of teaching and learning, the university aims to provide an education to all students which will equip them intellectually to the best international standards. The university's goal is to develop graduates whose knowledge, skills, abilities and attitudes are highly valued and all allow them to contribute to the workplace and to the broader community. Whether you are here today to celebrate your first undergraduate degree, a postgraduate coursework degree, or the research higher degree of Doctor of Philosophy, you have acquired comprehensive and well-founded knowledge in the relevant discipline, appropriate professional knowledge and skills, the ability to think logically and laterally, critically and creatively, and to use these qualities effectively in decision-making and problem-solving. There are two critical tests of the quality of the education you've received from this university. One relates to your satisfaction as a graduate and the other to your employability. As new graduates, you will have received the Graduate Careers Council of Australia's Graduate Destination Survey and the Course Experience Questionnaire. Responses to these two instruments by graduates from previous years demonstrates a very high level of satisfaction with their educational experience at the University of Newcastle. In addition, commencing salaries for Newcastle graduates continue to be higher than the national average, indicating that our graduates are highly competitive against those of other Australian universities. Employer satisfaction, as reported in the university's own employer survey, is also very pleasing. The speed and nature of change in our society today is such that whatever qualification you have completed, you will need to be engaged in lifelong learning to be and remain successful and valued as a citizen, employee or manager. I'm confident that the skills which you have acquired during your study at this university will stimulate the continuous search for more knowledge and understanding. These in turn will equip you to make significant contributions to the local, national and in the case of some, the international community. In the area of research performance, the university currently ranks 10th out of 39 public universities in Australia. It has an annual research income of $25 million and a total annual expenditure on research projects, research scholarships and research infrastructure of about $36 million. This is an outstanding research achievement. I take this opportunity to remind those receiving their test aimers today that as graduates of the university, you automatically become members of convocation. You thus join more than 50,000 other graduates worldwide and have an opportunity through elected representatives to become involved in the governance and development of the university. I hope that many of you will take up that opportunity. I now call on Professor Bill Hogarth, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty of Science and Information Technology, to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Design, Inga Berthold. Tony Bird. <laughs> Kristen Byrne.
Tina Chan. Juliana Chow. David Cochran. Simon Collins. Marissa Devitol. Fiona Jewis. Hamish Downey. Adrian Edmonds. Kevin Bruce. Adrian Hamalay. Benjamin Hillis. Samantha Howe. Markel Hugh. John Hyde. Ita Kensar. Carmen Label. Alexander Lee. Jacqueline Lindsay. Christian Lomax. Shailen Love. Cora Jane Dennis. Lucy McIntosh. Jan Miller. Joshua Morris. Kate Murray. Ingrid Nemansa. Rebecca Pierce. Mary Posmo. Matthew Regan. <laughs> Elizabeth Rowe. <laughs> Natalie Sky. <laughs> Sally 
Chávez. Vincent. Shay Whiteman Murphy. Jeffrey Williams. Jasmine Williams. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Design with Honours Class 2, Division 2, Daniel Hall. <laughs> Nicholas P. <laughs> Lexi Lenner. Trent Penfold. <laughs> Brooke Richards. <laughs> Rosalind Thompson. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Design with Honours Class II Division I, Timothy Chenery. <laughs> Hayden Davis. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Design, Visual Communication, Sonia Andrews. <laughs> Belinda Osip. <laughs> James Bennett. Samantha Boswell. Karen Brown. Christopher Burns. Chad Costello. Claire Enright. Adam Evans. Kylie Fisher. Sally Gordon. Shannon Harding. <laughs> Liam Hogan. <laughs> Andrea Idol. <laughs> Daniel Lynch. Ashley Maxwell. <laughs> Jessica Mayhew. <laughs> Lee Pastor. Who 
Peter Poetis. Sharon Roy. Katrina Ryle. Heidi Sagaru. Randy Stein. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Design Visual Communication with Honours Class 2, Division 2, Lindsay Chandler. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Visual Design, Bachelor of Design Visual Communication with Honours Class 2, Division 1, Prudence Scott. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Design Visual Communication with Honours Class 1, Jan Sherlock. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Environmental Science, Warren Brown. Matthew Clark. Elise Cox. Karen Duran. Daniel Beeson. <laughs> Jade Freeman. Erin <laughs> Fuller. <laughs> Alan Garland. Heidi Gleason. <laughs> Rachel Gleason. <laughs> Robert Gothard. <laughs> Stuart Grewell. Christy Close. <laughs> Brett Haywood. <laughs> Matthew Hill. Matthew first. Sorry, Michelle first. <laughs> Catherine Kelly. <laughs> Sally Lane. Cole Lane. <laughs> Ian Mark. <laughs> Brett McLean.
McLaren. Timothy Murtaugh. Patrick Shell. Adam Schultz. Lisa Stevens. Melissa Thomas. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Environmental Science with Honours Class 2, Division 1, Stephen Chalamon. Into a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Environmental Science with Honours Class 1, Anthony Spence. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Information Science, Anthony Christopopoulos. Adrian Gray. Matthew Griffiths. Joshua Hardy. Kim. <laughs> Sally Nudson. <Nutsen. laughs> Lou Lawson. Him. 
Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Van Drift. Benton Boyd. John Boise. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Mathematics, Amanda Morris. you a graduate of the award of Bachelor of Mathematics and Bachelor of Science. The graduate has studied for both degrees simultaneously. Anna Milk. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science. Alison Asper. Christopher Hennessy Mill. <laughs> Nicholas Hodges. <laughs> Peter. 
during. Carlina Jones. Tracy Mann. Neil Martin. Stuart McLean. Lucina Quillen. Joanne Piggott. Jody Reynolds. Danielle Rogers, Daniel Smith. Sullivan. <laughs> Joanne Sutton. <laughs> Jeffrey Tate. <laughs> Matthew Wu. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts. The graduate has studied for both awards simultaneously. Louise Hughes. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science with Honours Class II Division I, Adrian Burke. Sandra Felton. <laughs> Catherine Kulanek. <laughs> Mark Stables. <laughs> Nicholas Villa. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science with Honours Class 1, Alexander Cockerell. <laughs> Nancy Dickman. <laughs> Simon Ferguson. Emmeline Smith. Megan Will.
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Aviation, Paul Bond. Mason Ku. Tristan Hema. Ryan Jamison. Juliet Clarica. Timothy Leach. Richard Lezinski. Adam Ramsey. Peter Sorry. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Biotechnology, Nicole Cross. <laughs> Justin Dower. <laughs> Justin Houghton. David McIntyre. Christy Marshall. Kate McCann. Sean Maroney. Jonathan Ball. Jane Skeets. Linda Soldas. Lincoln Stan. Simone Tane. Agnieszka Blinkman. Sally Williamson. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Biotechnology with Honours Class II, Division I, Christopher Ainsworth. <laughs> Renee Crompton. <laughs> Amy Lonergan. Linda Mercer. Donna Dale Morton.
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Biotechnology with Honours Class 1, Elise Buckery. Annalise Johnson. Jacqueline Morley. Chancellor, the university medal may be awarded to a candidate who has achieved first class honours and displayed exceptional academic ability. In assessing ability, the graduate's record throughout the whole degree program is taken into account, as well particular emphasis is given to the final year of study. In addition to achieving consistently high grades, the graduate must have completed at least half their degree requirements at this university. I Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Biotechnology with Honours Class 1 and the University Medal, Janet Holt. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science, Forensic, Amy Chapman. <laughs> Troy Edmiston. Darren Brazil. Sally Ross. I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Science Professional with Honours Class 1, Jacqueline Whitehead. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates a degree of Bachelor of Science Psychology, Marissa Black. Hunster. Brett Wickham. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Science Psychology with Honours Class 2, Division 2, Katarina Hooper.
Chancellor, I present to you graduates with a degree of Bachelor of Science Psychology with Honours, Class 2, Division 1, Amanda Brown. Hilary Buckley. Richard Cutler. Kelly Maxwell. Jill Sedgman. Tiana Wolfgang. Chancellor, I present to you graduates with a degree of Bachelor of Science Psychology with Honours Class 1, Sandra Feber. <laughs> Sue Lynn Play smith <laughs> James Hunt. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Applied Psychology, Belinda Edwards. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Environmental Studies, Stephen Curran. Chancellor, I present to you graduates with a degree of Master of Information Technology, Hayden Schilling. <laughs> Yin Hai Eric Wong. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Science. Friends, Sayurika. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Science and Information Technology. I call on Professor Ron MacDonald, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research, to present research higher degree graduates. Chancellor, I present to you Heather Irvine for the degree of Master of Psychology Clinical. Ms Irvine's thesis is entitled, Educating Parents in Child Behaviour Modification, a Comparison of Three Instructional Techniques. Chancellor, Heather Irvine. Chancellor, I present to you Matthew Stanton for the degree of Master of Psychology Clinical. Mr Stanton's thesis is entitled, The Effect of Student Involvement in a Mental Health Drama Upon Knowledge of and Attitudes Towards Mental Illness. Chancellor, Matthew Stanton. <laughs> Chancellor. The degree of Doctor of Philosophy is awarded to a graduate who has successfully completed a prescribed program of study, principally of research, over a period of up to four or five years. A thesis embodying the outcomes of the research is the principal basis of examination. The degree is only awarded if the thesis makes a significant and original contribution to knowledge and to our understanding of the field of knowledge with which it is concerned. Today, the university is proud to honour Doctor of Philosophy graduates who have satisfied these rigorous criteria for the award of the degree. Chancellor, I present to you Susan Cockle, Bachelor of Teaching with Honours from Griffith University. 
Dr. Cockle's thesis is entitled, Individual Differences in Executive Control and Motivation and Their Relationships to Performance on Aviation, Academic and Applied Tasks. Chancellor, Dr. Cockle. Chancellor, I present to you Mark Graham, Bachelor of Science with Honours from this University. Dr. Graham's thesis is entitled Characterization of the Phosphorylation of Triocene Hydroxylase Using Electrospay Mass Spectrometry. Chancellor, Dr. Graham. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you Alan Lansdowne, Bachelor of Science with Honours from this University. Dr. Lansdowne's thesis is entitled Seasonality in Australia. Does vitamin D play a role? Chancellor, Dr. Lansdowne. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you David Sabret, Bachelor of Mathematics and Master of Medical Statistics from this university. Dr. Sabret's thesis is entitled, A Decision Tree Approach to Analyzing Very Large Data Sets. Chancellor, Dr. Sabret. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of research higher degree graduates. I now call upon the Vice-Chancellor to present a candidate for an honorary degree. Chancellor, David Williams was an only child born in 1935 in London in the United Kingdom. From the age of one, he was raised in Wilmslow, Cheshire. David attended Wilmslow Primary, Manchester Grammar Preparatory and Manchester Grammar Schools. His attendance at Manchester Grammar involved two bus rides and a train ride, a one and a half hour journey to school. The curriculum at the school was highly specialised, which supported all students becoming well educated, albeit within a narrow curriculum. At 15 years of age, David sat for his A-levels, the equivalent of the high school certificate. However, due to his family's financial situation, David was unable to sit for the Oxford and Cambridge entrance examinations. David had visions of becoming a physicist after having rejected the thought of a medical career due to the Latin studies that were involved. He accepted a position as a laboratory assistant with a prominent textiles company, Tootle Broadhurst Lee. The company pioneered the resin treatment of rayon to achieve crease resistance. He subsequently undertook employment as a laboratory assistant, assistant with Ilfords and the British Rayon Research Association. During this time, he also studied externally for a Bachelor of Science with Honours Degree at the University of London. After marrying, David Williams joined the International Tin Research Institute in the United Kingdom. He then undertook research into organotin compounds at Perivale in Middlesex. In the early 60s, after a dreadful London summer when the sun didn't shine for weeks and a winter when pea super fogs were plentiful, David decided to emigrate to Australia. He joined the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, known as the CSIRO. When introduced to the acting chief, Bob was invited to, sorry, David was invited to call him Bob, which he considered to be a welcome relief from English formality. With the use of coal as a fuel source becoming less popular, the CSIRO formed the Mineral Research Laboratories in 1970. David's research changed from studying the kinetics of reactions between atoms and simple molecules to the kinetics of alternative copper smelting processes and mineralogy. The change in the direction of his research was initially viewed by David with alarm, but in retrospect was a significant step in his career. As the years progressed, energy issues regained prominence and environmental concerns increased. David began researching the point source plume emissions from industries and power stations and how these emissions were dispersed in the atmosphere. A research group led by David Williams was the first to track the sulphur dioxide plume from Mount Isa, Queensland smelter complex by aircraft. They identified that under characteristic slow-moving optic conditions, the plume extended over 1,500 kilometres to the coast of Western Australia. 
David Williams was, has been very active in air pollution research in the Hutter Valley. The research has entailed measuring pollution emissions from power stations in Lake Macquarie and the Upper Hunter Valley and defining their dispersion characteristics. Measurements have been obtained using leading edge aircraft technology which was developed at the laboratories and workshops, workshops of CSIRO fuel technology. Through this research the cross-sectional characteristics of the emission plume were obtained which in turn has led to better inputs for dispersion models. David Williams' field of competency includes the management and direction of scientific research, which involves modelling and measurement of traffic generated pollution. In 1975, David Williams investigated air pollution, specifically the nature and origin of Sydney's urban haze. In the early 1980s, David Williams was the first researcher in Australia to characterise the fine particle emissions from diesel truck engines. The contributions provided by David Williams have provided scientific input to federal government inquiries and decision making about fine particles, their health impacts and the need for control of emissions. David Williams was a member of Task Group 5 which dealt with a transport logistics for the inquiry into urban air pollution in Australia. He also worked with Associate Professor Howard Bridgman at the University of Newcastle to conduct the first research in Australia on the emissions from lawnmowers and diesel railroad engines. In 2000, David Williams was commissioned by the New South Wales Department of Urban Affairs and Planning to review the emissions from the M5 East Tunnel for an environmental impact assessment. David is also a member of the Mount Isa Mines Panel Assessment Study. The group was set up by the Queensland Government to oversee the smelting operations at Mount Isa with the advent of a large sulphuric acid plant. David Williams recently retired from his position as Senior Principal Research Scientist at the CSIRO Division of Energy Technology after a career spanning 38 years. Until 2001, David was also an associate editor of, the, of Atmos Atmospheric Environment, a major international specialist journal, and as a member of the Clean Air Society of Australia. During the course of his career, David Williams has published over 70 articles and reports, the majority of which appear in, appeared in refereed journals as well as 40 reports to industry and government departments. David Williams has made outstanding contributions to air quality research. Chancellor, it is with great pleasure that I present to you David Williams, Bachelor of Science with Honours of the University of London for the award of the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. By the authority delegated in me by the council, I hereby admit David Williams to the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa. We will now hear a musical item presented by Michael Davison. Michael Davison is one of Australia's leading performers on the didgeridoo and he is a master's student here at the conservatorium. Michael's research involves expanding our knowledge and understanding of the didgeridoo as a solo instrument capable of great expression and a variety of sounds similar to any other musical instrument. Today Michael will improvise a short piece which will demonstrate these qualities. Right, 
Carl Davison certainly shows us what a marvellous instrument the didgeridoo can be in the hands of an expert. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr Williams to deliver the occasional address. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, members of council, staff of the university, families and friends of those graduates, and finally, of course, the new graduates themselves. Let me congratulate you on your achievements. I think perhaps, Chancellor, that it would have been better to have dispensed with Mark Beach and had another 12 minutes of the didgeridoo. That was really quite magnificent. Chancellor, it is indeed an honor that the university bestows on me today. It's one that gives me great pleasure not just on account of the honour, or the, sort of the receiving of the honour, but on the circumstances which have surrounded the award of this honour, which have added and amplified to my pleasure. A form of positive feedback. Very rare these days, it's usually all negative. As an example, when I first got news of uh, the possibility of this award, I was working in Bangladesh on an air pollution management project, and I was having a very difficult time with this project. And the news of this award lifted my spirits immensely. As I stand before all this sea of young faces, it does indeed make me feel old. You are at the start of your careers, and I'm at the end of mine, Alpha and Omega. If one could plot our career paths on some sort of graph, then yours would be close to the origin, and mine would be asymptotically veering towards infinity, at least on the x-axis. I'm not quite certain where I would be on the y. In all my life, I've never worked out which is the ordinate and which is the abscissa. 
And the engineers and scientists amongst you would be very tempted to join these two points up by a straight line. We do this all the time and try and avoid doing another experiment which will throw our theories out of the window. But career paths are very seldom a straight line. There are all sorts of influences that affect what happens to you and how your career develops. Some of these influences you're hardly aware of at the time. Others you have no control of anyway. My own career's dodged around a bit. As the Chancellor said, uh, a series of lousy things made me decide to change countries, and I've never regretted it. My career has gone from gas phase kinetics through to synthesizing chalcopyrite in the laboratory to determining the fate of sulfur dioxide in a smelter plume. And these changes in research direction were caused by organizational changes within CSRO over which I had little or no influence. And the threat of change is not always bad. But the career path that you follow gets buffeted about in unpredictable ways. One of the things that remained constant throughout this change was that I was working with sulfur dioxide elementary gas phase reactions involving sulfur dioxide, trying to develop new smelting process which reduced emissions of sulfur dioxide, and when that failed, we thought we'd better find out what the hell happened to the sulfur dioxide once it got out into the atmosphere. And the other connecting link throughout this first 20 years was in the form of Dr. Moss Mulcahy, my boss, equivalent of a professor, who had more impact on the way my career developed than anybody else. Um, <clears throat> I was hoping that I could say that he was pleased to see him in the front row today, but unfortunately he got called away to Melbourne because a dear friend of his has died and he has to give the farewell address. But I know he rang me last night and he said he was here in spirit, and indeed I am pleased for that. Whilst studying the fate of sulfur dioxide in the Mount Isa smelter plume, we did, as the Chancellor pointed out, made measurements of the dimensions of this plume, how wide it was. By the time it got to Broome, it was 500 kilometers wide. Plume was very dilute, hardly measure it. But these measurements of the plume geometry turned out to be of great interest to atmospheric dispersion modelers. And so we focused more attention on this particular aspect. And it's that that brought me into contact with Newcastle University in the person of Howard Bridgman, who's on the desk today, and John Chambers, who I think has since retired. Howard and I started studying the dispersion of the Liddell station plume, then the most modern power station in New South Wales, with a view to determining dispersion characteristics for future power stations in the valley. Howard and I have since interacted on a number of occasions. He would ring me up and say, can you think of a project for a final year's honour person? And I would groan because I'd be up to my neck in work and I'd be late with reports and this was another intrusion. No, we sat down and talked about it, how I would find the funds and support, how I would find the experimental project and the equipment with which to carry this out. And this process has been a very beneficial to CSRO and I hope to the University Chancellor. Howard has sent me some very good students, credit to the University. And one of these students is still with us and given the right environment, he has the potential to go all the way. My old division, Energy Technology, is moving from Sydney to Newcastle, and I'm pleased to see that the chief of that division, Dr. John Wright, is present here today. I think there's going to be bums on seats, as we put it, by the end of this year, mostly support staff, and about 12 years later, the scientific staff will be put into place. This relocation to Newcastle will provide a much greater uh, capability for interacting in the sort of way that I have done with Howard. And I hope and encourage the CSRO and the university to take up these opportunities.
I've been asked by the university to make some comments which might be of use to you. And I thought, oh, yes, dead easy. And then I put the brain in gear when I was thinking what I was going to say, and I thought, oops. <laughs> what is it that I could say to you which you might at all be interested in or which might at all influence you? Not long ago, most of you were teenagers and wouldn't have listened to anybody. <laughs> Has anything changed? Well, I hope so. The passage of a few years and the health of the university, I hope that's not quite the situation now. One quality that we want, and I reinforce the Chancellor's comments at his introductory speech, is that we require clear and critical thinking from you. This is very important. In science and engineering, this particular quality has developed to its most quantitative way. The university is the start of training you to be critical thinkers. It's not a, something that can be just switched on like that. Some people are better at critical thinking than others. And in the postgraduate years in the university, that is the prime objective, in my view, is to train you to think critically and clearly. When you leave university and go into the workplace, you will still require this capability to be developed. And how do you get this ability? Well, you can do it by experience through carrying out experiments in the laboratory or in the field. Experience, as Oscar Wilde has noted, is the name that we give to our mistakes. And we should be encouraged to let you make mistakes because they are a very good training type of regime. The only trouble is we don't know what mistakes we should allow you to make. The other way of fast tracking this is to come under the guidance of somebody. And if you were fortunate enough, as I did, to come under the guidance of Maurice Mulcahy, then you will be lucky indeed. But I suspect, in the current circumstances these years, the chances of that happening to you are greatly diminished. And I'd like to just outline some of the reasons why I think that is the case. The major one is that senior staff who have the experience to pass on to you no longer have the time to carry out what I would call the proper nurturing and guidance duties. And there are two things that have impacted on this or reduced this amount of time. Whilst organisations like CSIRO and the universities are very good at putting their critical thinking caps on when it comes to scientific research and generating papers, it's quite obviously not the case when it comes to management. Why else would we have so many restructurings? Year after year, every five years, we have a restructuring of any of these organizations. And if we had a clear and critical blueprint of how we should manage ourselves, this would not be necessary. The problem is, although you can think critically and clearly about the administration of your own particular area, when you move to the next layer up, you find there are different group of people with different agendas, some of them hidden, different ideas. And when you go up to the next level, you run into politics, vested interests, not all of them benign, and of course, the devil of them all, economic constraints. The other time consumer that affects senior scientists is that of occupational health, safety, and questions of public liability and accountability. When I returned from Bangladesh recently, I saw on the television I could have bought three elephants from Ashton Circus. I had no need for three elephants. Three elephants. However, the reason they were for sale was that they were too expensive to insure for public liability reasons. Obstetricians are threatening only to carry out deliveries via cesarean section because it's much less risky than natural birth, financially that is. And you've seen recently the collapse of medical insurance funds. Things are obviously not right. Whilst I applaud the push for greater work place safety and certainly the greater access to the law to redress complaints, 
it's quite clear that we do not have the optimum systems for managing these social improvements. And this is a challenge for those somewhere between my point at infinity and your point at zero to try and rectify. But I suspect some of this will still spill over into your tasks as you move down your career, or up your career, I hope. And one of the other factors in all this, of course, is that we're dealing with human behavior. And human behavior will always find a means of uh, outwitting a critical thinker. However, all is not lost. Please talk to your fellow colleagues, your fellow scientists. You can do this in-house over the tea table. Not why the night's lost to the Broncos, but uh, how you should be carrying out a certain project. You can do this and do it at seminars and in workshops. And this will fill, help fill the gap. Indeed, when I first started at CSIRO so many years ago, I and a colleague who was transported out to the colonies on the same ship that I was, we started out a discussion club, which was after ours, which was to generate and discuss problems that we faced of the day. Some people called this a drinking club. Well, maybe it was. <laughs> but I'm very pleased that uh, my uh, fellow uh, Sputnik, if I can call him my fellow traveller, Ian Smith, is also with me here today. Chancellor, I'm indeed grateful for the degree that your university has awarded me. I'm very honoured. And I am pleased, and I am very pleased for some of the reasons that I've just outlined. And in conclusion, I would say that uh, I am currently living in India, and I was going to be separated from my wife for a few weeks, but when this award came up, she decided that she'd like to be here uh, with me today, and um, I'm delighted she is. <laughs> Finally, Chancellor, I'd just like to wish all the new graduates bon voyage on your new careers. Dr. Williams, thank you very much for those excellent words of guidance from origin to infinity. <laughs> I now have great pleasure in inviting Michael Shin to speak on behalf of the graduates. Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, members of the Council, university staff, families and friends of graduates, and most importantly, graduates. Well, when asked to prepare a graduate address, I didn't realise it was going to give such a diverse bunch of students to talk about. Nevertheless, I'll endeavour to draw together some of our commonality within the diversity so that we can reflect on our time at this respected university. We came from a diversity of backgrounds. Some of us came fresh from the HSC, others maturer, entered through TAFER Open Foundation. More came from overseas to delight in the unique cultural experience, while others still, yearning for the punishment that university life delivers, came back for graduate and postgraduate qualifications. Our commonality, therefore, lies in our willingness to leave previous lives behind and eagerly embrace the life of a university student. Our commonality, of course, extends to our achievement, in which the completion of, of our studies or programs of research is both an extraordinary academic feat, but also an extraordinary personal one. In achieving this formidable task, we have endured poverty, malnutrition, stress, substance abuse, and even university parking. However, <laughs> I expect the pain is dulled now, some five months after the last exam was set or the last assignment submitted, and so I think it's fitting then that we all reflect once more on what it is meant to be a student at this university. Throughout the formative phases of our student development, we often exhibited a nervous excitement, tempered by motivation to tackle the academic challenges that lay ahead, a motivation that was most often instilled by our really appreciated and enthralling lecturers. 
After but a few weeks of becoming accustomed to the university surrounds, we students again tended to diversify, which is perhaps the consequence of a biased survey of the crumpled and dog-eared union map kept in our back pockets since O'Day. Many of us found the union building early in the piece, or more importantly, the bars that were concealed within. Other of us, others of us found their calling with the muscle mad and the fitness freaks at the forum. For most of us, though, there was some form of balance to our daily activities. Of course, while we were becoming adjusted to this radically different social arena, our academic workload was accumulating. Assignment dates were creeping up and exams were looming ever closer. By the end of first year, though, most of us have made the transition from naive and excited commencing students to fully-fledged university students. Well versed in the arts of cramming, one nighter assignments and deciphering the hieroglyphic summaries that were our classmates' lecture notes. With a little help from our parents, our partners, our lecturers, supervisors, librarians and some union staff, and with our newfound skills, we were able to survive the next few years. Despite all of the seemingly dodgy practices though, I'm sure that most of us did seriously work very hard. There will have been untold hours poured into submitting assignments, attending lectures and laboratories, building models, running simulations, studying for exams and in completing experiments. And indeed it is an extraordinary accomplishment, reaching both the peak of our student development while in parallel completing our studies. And after much dedication to these two tasks, it is now time for us to feel both satisfaction and relief. Every one of us then should look back at this celebration of our achievement with pride. For many of us though, graduation not only celebrates our achievements, but also serves to mark the beginning of a bright future that presents fresh challenges. Fresh challenges that require us to change once more. In my vocation, science, there have been considerable challenges and also considerable change. Science has come a long way since its beginnings, when there are all kinds of crazy ideas floating around, like that a piece of rhinoceros horn could increase your potency. Though after some time of toying with notions such as this, we developed a method for separating the good propositions from the bad. The idea here was to try one and see if it worked, and if it didn't, to eliminate it. This method gradually developed in what we would now recognise as science. The pace of scientific progress has increased remarkably since its beginnings, and it comes to be that we find ourselves in a society where scientific advances wield an increasing influence over everyday lives. Clearly though, it's not only scientific change that drives societal evolution, but also the advances in many other fields like design, information technology, mathematics and psychology. As experts in these professions, we will participate in the coming advances that shape the future we live in. Whatever our vocation, it will be our common challenge to blend these advances harmoniously with a society that is sensitive to change. So in leaving university, we are again presented with the challenge of change, this time into positively contributing members of society. In evolving to this role, we will be required to introduce the advances we deliver in a form that offers effective solutions to complex problems problems including sustainable use of resources in a world where the population is both increasing and increasingly demanding. Successful solutions will require that we are not merely competent in our immediate vocations but also understand and embrace all views of the world. This demands a literacy in politics, in economics and environmental, a social and a cultural literacy. In short, we must re-engineer our thinking in order to be sympathetic with all views of the world. This is the challenge that lies ahead, perhaps just something to ponder to leave. For the rest of tonight, however, it is time just to celebrate, reflect on your achievements, and fondly reminisce the years past with friends made during a stay. Go forth and change the world for the better graduates. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much, Michael Sheehan, for your words. I now declare this ceremony concluded. The University Union invites you to make your way to the University Club in the Shortland Union Courtyard where tea will be served. A testama framing service will be available in the foyer of the club. You will be able to order photographs and view a range of university memorabilia for sale in the Shortland Union building. That concludes the commercial, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Graduates and guests are also invited to take the opportunity before moving down there to meet with the staff of the University under the marquee next to the Great Hall. Thank you very much.